samas Tartu kolleksusse Tänis Eesti muusiumi keskuse peadu keskusesse. Welcome to Tartu College. How many people doesn't speak or understand any assignment here? No one? A few. A few? Yeah. One. So then we have to speak English probably because you know, we don't want anyone to feel bad and uncomfortable. Uh, Ellen, what about you? Like? You're, you're the, yeah, you, you, you own this space. Very happy to be here and have, I think this is our first uh, live co-presentation of something. So this is really quite a unique experience and it's really fun because it's working out beautifully, I think. And what we were proposing to do uh, tonight, there are three films uh, who, the, of which the filmmakers are here, and we were thinking of doing each of them in turn because we have such wonderful people, so we would do each of the films in turn. So I, I would like to put it to a vote. Does that make sense? Or should we have all the filmmakers up here all at once? All in favor of one at a time? All right, that's an overwhelming majority. Sounds good. <laughs> Um, and then for my part, uh, did you want to talk a little bit about what Demo does Demo is? Or? Yes. Well, maybe, because there are people who doesn't even know maybe that Demo exists. Demo is very Estonian Museum, Estonian Museum Canada. We are uh, holding here the biggest Estonian film collections outside of Estonia. The collections go back to over 50 years by now, and we have a quite a lively, uh, lively culture program here. So Baruto is just now visiting Toronto and having different meetings with Japanese and Estonian community in the city. And we have like 40 to 50 uh, different events through the season. Well, the worst year was when we had 70. And uh, definitely that was too much for organizers and also for the audience. So we tried to not have that many events, but uh, those include lectures, seminars, workshops, film screenings, theater shows. Uh, Nuri Theater from Estonia just arrived here a couple of days ago. We'll have a um, place here on Friday and Saturday evening. So like different things we do here. Uh, we have uh, paid stuff and we have lots of volunteers who help us out with our, our collections, but also with the culture program. And at the end of May, we will have our biggest cultural event, which is Estonian Music Week. We celebrate five years of Estonian Music Week here. Lots of great musicians from Estonia and elsewhere would come here, and concerts would happen here in Toronto and Hamilton as well. And Estonian Art Centre, the charity associated with Gesko's International Estonian Centre, is, is an arts charity that was established in 1975 and is being resurrected. It had a very rich history of many of the same events that Birok was describing. And uh, it, uh, its big event uh, will be the opening of Geskus. In the meantime, the second round of women's uh, dance workshop, so Dansu Lager, uh, hasn't really even been advertised for the middle of September. And we already have registrants from New Zealand, from the West Coast. Um, so it's gonna be a, a lot of fun again this year and a number of other events that are in the works. So, looking to work uh, closely uh, with them uh, to bring arts programming. I think this is enough of an introduction already. Yep. Yes. We All right, yes. Let's, let's get out of here. We have guests. So the first film in Hot Dogs that, that uh, was screened was Smokes on a Sisterhood. So I thought we would start with that. Would that be okay? Anna and Maria? Yeah. Yep. Okay. For those who haven't seen yet the film, our, all we're going to do is play the trailer, and then we'll get to asking some questions. Okay. Perfect. So, Smokes on the Sisterhood, I think we all know, has won the directing award at Sundance, an another award just recently on the West Coast. It is becoming um, really 
it has always been a hot commodity because it's made in a sauna. So there you go. <laughs> so I would like you to introduce yourself so I don't uh, accidentally um, give someone an editing credit or a producer credit. Uh, Anna, can we start with you? Tere, hello. I am Anna. I am Anna, Inns director of this film. And next to me is my little part, small part of my wonderful team. Hello, I am uh, Marianne Ostrat, the producer of this film. Very happy to be in Toronto. Uh, my name is Enrik Madar. Uh, I'm the editor of this film. We're so honored, actually, that you are here today. And I thought we would start off with um, asking Anna, what is the most typical question she gets asked in a panel discussion? <laughs> <clears throat> there are uh, several. Um, one thing is about how, did, how the hell did you shoot this film in a hot sauna where the average temperature is 80, 80 degrees Celsius, and uh, sometimes 90 degrees. <laughs> so the, so the sweat isn't fake? No, it's okay. not fake. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is another, like, uh, like, this all is so real and so intimate, like, did you, like, have to, like, rehearse, are these actors, or is it real? And I have to say, yes, it is all real. All the stories are, are shared, uh, are just there in front of camera, uh, and it's, they are not actors. <laughs> so, um, but how did we shoot it? And uh, it was a real challenge for a lot of cinematographers or a lot of producers also. It would be like, no way. Uh, but um, as a director, you have to choose the right people. So um, a cinematographer had a camera, Ari, that survived, but it had uh, ice packs around. <laughs> uh, then um, we had to adjust lens inside sauna, we had to adjust it because smoke sauna you heat uh, six hours. And then uh, first you put a lens uh, on the floor, then you put it onto the first level of the two hours, and then to a higher level. And then another lens was outside because uh, you are inside and then you go to breathe outside and you cannot um, uh, do it with the same lens because it would, uh, you know, it wouldn't work all that effort. To, it has to adjust the heat. Then a uh, cinematographer had uh, a cold, wet um, like cloth, like all the time dripping, <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, gloves. Uh, because the camera gets hot once he got burned because he really went into shooting and didn't notice and then he had some burn but um, uh, and the wet gloves around um, imagine sound recordist all the time in this kind of like position it was a total challenge and we had to and I as director really had to pay attention first of all that everyone is safe physically safe, nobody's going to die there, you know, or get heat stroke and there's enough uh, water that they're drinking all the time. But of course, uh, keeping the safe space also because the stories and are really intimate. One sauna session lasts for four hours around like that. And then, you know, then when the jewel starts to appear, the, you start to sweat off the dirt from your body and from your soul and then the deeper shit starts to come up, then you have to be ready to shoot it because they are not actors. And um, so this has been told, uh, oh, then of course, like, when can we come to cinema, when is it coming? Uh, we have Canadian distributor, it is coming to uh, Canadian cinemas. A um, lot of feedback. I mean, every day, today I got uh, four letters. I also got an um, invitation by Estonian Tervisoja Töötä at Elites. There are like doctors and psychologists and they said they read my interviews, they saw the film and they want me to come and talk and help with them. Help to talk about my own experience in that film is my own experience of rape, for example. And um, so there is a lot of personal feedback, um, a lot of stories to share. So I feel this film is like you know, it's not just that I show it, but after the film, there are so many who share, not just women, but also men, who share their stories, and, and I have to be sensitive um, also. Is there something I'm missing from the questions that have been asked? There are several. Maria, 
ihan alas kuin voi olla Uh, what you find to women? Oh, yes. <laughs> men, uh, men ask that question. Where do you find women? <laughs> um, some of my friends uh, that I knew, uh, but I made a film in seven years. So during the seven years, there were also women who came to my life. And you know, on one occasion, it was really interesting. Uh, we were shooting, we were living in the countryside, and uh, a woman came from another village and uh, said that she heard that there is filming, can, can I come to sauna? And I was like, okay, yes, come. Because uh, I felt that, okay, it's, it's not a chance. Um, um, it's, it's meant to be like that. Mm, so different, unfortunately, right now, um, that I, it has been, so it has not been a problem for me that, um, uh, like I, as I did it, uh, I was very transparent with them, everyone from the beginning to the level of honesty that I'm looking after, and I believe in transparent filmmaking. Um, some are doing a lot of manipulation, you know, like, for example, they don't show the cut to their people, but for me it was very important that the sisterhood does not start and end in smoke sauna, but it really carries on uh, into the edit that we showed the cuts, I didn't, you know, to have their voices. Making this kind of film, you kind of take the voice away and also now, and, uh, and it was really like a transformational process for not just the women, for me, I was there naked with them in sauna, but also to all of us who made it. And, uh, and it's, it's continuing because now we're traveling throughout the world and, and, and meeting, meeting um, everyone. And I can say that this need uh, for this kind of safe space to be vulnerable uh, is totally universal. And also what is interesting is when we now go in different cultures is how that culture is uh, connecting themselves to nudity. That is interesting, the questions that come, you know, um, like in Hong Kong, for example, the film could never be in theaters because there are naked women and uh, what the government does is not just blur, but they put, they Photoshop clothes on. So... <laughs> Some traditional national Chinese clothes. So, uh, so, or you know, so it's it's very interesting. And in San Francisco, where we just came, um, uh, people, some people stood up and applauded in the middle of the film, where there is talk about that female have the right to their body, because it's a very, a very current topic in USA. You know, where they were just discussing. Uh, if to make a law to, to, that women should uh, register their menstruation. You know. yeah. So, um, yeah, and also maybe what I want to say is that uh, my background is in uh, photography and for me it was very, very, like, the big challenge was, like, when I have naked women, how to do it that there is no sexualized glance on them? Like, because when you take, when you, I remember the professor from my school, in the first, um, uh, already first uh, lesson, uh, he was telling that when you take out camera and somebody says that you have camera and this is showing objectivity, it is bullshit. It is always subjectivity. You always have a glance. Are you aware of that glance or not? What is your glance? And a lot of, lot of times we, don't, we are not aware of the glance. And uh, so like, we are so used to seeing women sexualized with a male gaze. So how to show nakedness without different plants, you know? So we were working with that, and, and that was my deep like fear, like or like how will it come out? And I'm happy to hear that there is no sexual glance. This is from feedback. But maybe my dear fellow teammates want to share their part. I uh, wanted to add. Uh, a uh, few things regarding this uh, shooting in the sauna. Uh, I got this idea, this challenge, it inspired me. And uh, I heard about the broken lenses and the Pants and Panna were basically almost painted and were growing up and they had the smoke poisoning. Uh, once, once. Yeah, I heard about it in Sundance during the Q&A, they didn't even tell me. <laughs> so uh, they weren't forced to do this kind of stuff. And then uh, regarding these women uh, and their being involved in the editing, they weren't sitting in the editing room, but yes, they had to say if there is something that they are 
completely uncomfortable with and don't want to have in the film. They were very brave and there was very little such things. Basically, one story we removed because um, this woman felt that it's a very active story and uh, she will hurt other people when she uh, makes it public. But uh, it wouldn't have been possible otherwise. You can't produce a film like that if you don't, uh, you can't just take the material and do whatever. So that was also a practical tool to even like uh, have it uh, done to do this kind of film. And then, uh, yes, regarding the distribution, it's uh, North America is sold out because it's the only two countries, maybe. <laughs> Very easy. Very easy. Yes. But also most of Europe uh, and Australia, and uh, we will have a, a theatrical distribution. It's fantastic, it's a dream. We were really uh, hoping with Anna, and that was our wish and dream that the film would be distributed in theatres, because it's, uh, that's the film for cinema, where we were hoping, or our intention was that it would sort of break the fourth floor, uh, wall, and uh, this collective viewing experience and the dark room of cinema whole, whole plays a part in this film. So uh, it's really fantastic. And we get many emails and uh, messages and questions. Uh, when can we see the film? How can I see it here? How can I see it there? It will uh, come to cinemas in uh, most Western and western oriented countries. Uh, Asia and uh, Latin America have been a bit slower. Um, but we have a VOD in uh, Hong Kong, for example, also. So, uh, this is beautiful to see how it is transcending the cultural borders and uh, borders of states. Human beings are the same everywhere. So actually we hope that it somehow becomes available also in these more difficult territories. And, um, is there any yes. Yeah. Uh, Mariana, what, what, what was the first thought that went through your head when Anna came to you with the story? What were, what was your... I what, have, what, was, what was your greatest concern or, or your greatest I didn't have concern. I didn't have concerns. It was a full body, yes. No. <laughs> uh, but I have a story with it uh, because my roots are also in Setoma from my father's side. And uh, while Anna worked on the film for seven years, I worked for four because for the first three years another producer was developing it with Anna and they arrived to like late development, early production. They had just started to shoot. Uh, and I remember when in 2016 uh, uh, they got development funding from Estonian Film Institute and I was checking the projects that had just got funding and I saw this project and I was like, okay universe, how is it possible that I'm not producing this film? <laughs> and three years later uh, Anna calls me because this other producer unfortunately had died and offered it to me and uh, the situation was very complicated um, but I didn't have any doubt that I want to do it. And yes, first I uh, saw it uh, as a sort of local little Estonian sauna film and didn't understand the uh, international potential it has. But then we uh, took uh, almost, not a year, maybe like, maybe like nine months, like for a baby, you know. Um, and uh, uh, participated in a very beautiful initiative, Ice and Fire Docs Fees, I think, is uh, involved in starting it, um, by Estonian Documentary Guild and uh, Finnish uh, Documentary, what's the name of this organization? Yeah. Guild. So a workshop in Estonia, yes, in Estonia and uh, a little bit in Finland, uh, where we really uh, restarted it for ourselves and aligned our visions and ourselves. And then there was uh, one sales agent, and strangely enough, I had a, had a collaboration with the sales agent that didn't go well. But she, and it was a bit awkward to have her there from Paris. Uh, but she was our like one-time consultant, and she looked out uh, on this development trailer that Anna and Ero who was the first producer, had done, and asked us, "So girls, do you want to go to Sundance with this film?" And then and there we understood the potential it has that this could, I didn't even think in this category, that it could have a chance at Sundance and then it became a very clear goal. And then uh, a year and a half later, I think it was, we got funding from Sundance Institute. It was 1% chance to get this funding and we managed 18 projects out of 1,800. 1,800, yes. 
and then uh, the journey to the, and then you are on top of the pile for the festival. So then we knew that we have a much, much, much uh, more real chance to actually make it to the festival. But that was also a tricky journey, but uh, eventually it happened. And uh, I have seen uh, blabbering quite a lot, but it will wrap up soon. I have seen uh, also trailers for these other 17 projects that got this funding. And, and I call it Eastern European inter inferiority complex. Coming from Estonia, I always thought that I'm like the last one uh, about the line, you know, somehow sneaked in with my project. Like it was a miracle, miracle that it happened, that it almost didn't happen. But then I saw that our project uh, was completely unique and very strong in this election. Also, other projects were very good. There is one film against the tide that shows also here in Hot Dogs. They were also at Sundance. They were also there. Other films, also American films, very strong ones. But our film wasn't like the last one that somehow sneaked in or, you know, uh, some, someone messed up something and decided to put it as <laughs> and it was strong. And uh, then I have been thinking that maybe with the festival it was also actually a pretty, uh, pretty sure thing in the end. And then of course Anna's award uh, changed our lives. There is no question in that. Uh, we don't even like. Uh, I'm thinking back what I was thinking in January, and now these very new perspectives have opened up, and we don't still grasp the goal, uh, goal uh, scope of it. I think. No, it's been an amazing journey. We are traveling more than we are alone at the moment. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not something that happens once in your career. It happens something, it's something that happens uh, rarely. So uh, we are enjoying it and I'm very grateful. So thank you for having us here. And your experiences. Uh, well, I joined the uh, team much, much later, uh, but the uh, majority of uh, my work took place during the hottest, one of the hottest summer in Estonian history recently, uh, and in, uh, in a room without air conditioning. So I really, I think it really helped me to get closer <laughs> to the characters, <laughs> to be with them. Sweating. Absolutely. So it, it broke many barriers already. <laughs> But uh, this uh, film was absolutely unique uh, and the thought process to take it was super short because I had to. Uh, you don't get often such kind of unique footage uh, often. Uh, but what made it unique was uh, the uh, honest openness uh, of the ladies in the sauna. And you can imagine, especially because they are Estonians, which we are not used to, Estonian people, super honest, super open, talking about anything. Uh -huh. And uh, we're dealing with such uh, sensitive subjects, but we are talking about them without any, any shame and uh, judgment. Uh, but we, we really needed to invent, that was the game, how to invent in our own, was to invent the language of, uh, of the visual, visuals in a way that we are portraying human beings during their conversation, but most of the time we don't see their faces. So this was really an interesting trial error and uh, a creative process to figure out how to be in this conversation in a way you don't get bored, you don't get repetitive, and uh, you're, you're in it emotionally without seeing the person's face who's talking. So this was something unique and probably can use those experiences in the future. Uh, with this uh, non uh, faces, I have a story that it's for everyone who's interested in filmmaking. Um, the journey has really taught me to trust my intuition. And in the beginning, um, when I said, did the proposal, people also in the committee were very skeptical that there are no faces and how we were going to do it. And now, like critics and audience are praising it that it's so good that there are no faces <laughs> because there is like a portrait of this. Um, experience of what it means to be in the female body and then if there would be like oh this is Malla, this is Kadri, this is somebody else it would not be the same so it is like a journey how to trust your voice and I think what Mariana said this inferiority complex uh, definitely Soviet times have not <laughs> has have given fuel to that more it's also like how to how to trust it even when in the beginning maybe because it's in your mind, in your heart, and people don't see it the way you feel it. So um, how to still trust that voice 
And then eventually, when it comes to the audiovisual, then you can already show them there are no doubts. But the beginning can be difficult. And this was what Sundance jury told me that they, they especially said that, wow, so great, you stayed in sauna, you didn't show the faces like regularly. And I was like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> they got it. Uh, one question for uh, Hendrik is uh, what was the, um, how much, what was the ratio of footage to what actually went into the film? Uh, and was it higher or I like, was think it more? It's or? around 0.5 percent that's in the film, so it's uh, almost 200. 100,000, uh, no, 100 hours in my, as far as I know. No, we had, uh, we translated okay. 100 hours. Yeah, it yeah, was more, but there was it, also it was so it's the raw footage was somewhere between, I don't know, 120 to 60, 70,000. Not enough. Minutes. Minutes, sorry. Yeah, 100 to uh, 160 hours. Yeah. But it, is, it includes yeah. also nature shots. Yeah, yeah. 160 hours uh, yeah. approximately. Yeah. Because they, they shot it over six, seven years, so there was a lot of things. Very different styles and you can see how the how the project was developing and the idea is getting clearer year by year. So there are not, not much used from the really first years. Something is. Some is, but it's like still that. from the very first trailer. There are some. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'd open it up to the floor for questions, yeah. for a couple uh, of questions. I have a question. Oh, yeah. I have a question about, oh. you were talking about voice. Yes. And how sometimes you take away the voice. What, can you elaborate on that concept? You mean as a director that sometimes, yeah. uh, I, yeah, I'm not doing it. I am myself very, okay. as I said, transparent. I believe transparency in filmmaking. But what I'm saying is that there is practice and um, where directors feel that they can trick their subjects. And I don't believe in that. You know, like there are several cases where they film and then, uh, for example, they don't show their edit at all. And I feel it is wrong. And especially oh, with, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, especially with this kind of film, I, I could not, I mean, I couldn't imagine it. But in every film, like I believe it is, it is possible to make strong, honest and intimate things when you are including your subjects. I just wanted to add that I think the world is also changing in this matter because I think when uh, we applied for a little bit of additional financing for promotion from Sundance Institute, I actually had to uh, write in the application for what is our like uh, care plan for the participants or for the characters in the film. So, uh, and it is because they have been abused and there have been cases where they, uh, yes, where their voice has been taken away. But it always has to be the agreement between the director and the producer and the characters. And in this case, it wouldn't have been possible in other way. Nobody would have been come to the sauna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is very, very important. Uh, I think after Me Too, also, things are more talked about. And there is like, in uh, there is a lot of abuse has been in the history of cinema, a lot of abuse. And uh, now there is like, when you make a fiction, there is intimacy coordinator and, I mean, um, it's more. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, more regulated or more put emphasis to that, that you cannot abuse your subjects. And what is the abuse? Because there is like, you know, yelling at someone on set, it is abuse, but that was normality. But that was like normality for many, many years. Or the idea of a director that comes often from. Uh, um, only certain type of, you know, strong males who say that we have to, yeah, we can abuse, and this is this is changing now. But it's also tricky because our sales agents just told me about the case uh, that, that they have that uh, there are characters in the film who didn't say anything when the film came out, and then five years later they are suing because we were forced to be in the film. <laughs> So uh, it's a very, uh, very, very um, sensitive landscape and you have to know how to navigate it and it can be risky and then we did everything we can to kind of not even lower but eliminate these risks. Mm -hmm. yes. Peter? I was curious how, 
um, in your travels, especially in the States, have people been asking about the chanting? The yeah. Singing? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. And oh, the healing course. aspects of it. They have, oh yes, they have asked, of course, after uh, every screening, there are people who are like, how can we come to smoke salmon? <laughs> and then uh, a lot of male um, uh, people have asked, why the hell we don't talk about the real things? Why are we in sauna talking about like blah, blah, blah? You know, and so they started, I know, uh, some guys started in Tartu, um, uh, this kind of very intimate male sauna. Um, but chants and about the whole rituals and a lot of lot of talk and of oh and always I say uh, where the idea for the film has come from my own background uh, when I was uh, 11 and my grandfather had died and um, before the funeral we went to smoke sauna my granny me and um, aunt and niece and it was there where grandmother um, let out all um, anger and all, all emotions connected and shared the story that grandfather had actually lived with another woman not just like betrayed once but lived and she had kept it inside and there she released it and uh, made peace with that and then we could bury grandfather in peace so i'm talking about that i'm talking about my own own roots and uh, what the smoke sound what the concept is and in the states uh, when i mention uh, uh, like what is closest uh, in states or also in Canada is the Native American sweat lodge and then everyone understands because in smoke sauna you used to give birth, you used to wash the dead, you used to heal it is a sacred space very similar um, in the essence of what a smoke sauna is and then I talk about the bigger spiritual um, the whole holistic oh, yeah um, of, of where where the smoke sauna belongs to. It is a uh, context, yes, it is uh, um, this feeling that nature is alive. Uh, we, it's different understanding of time, it's not linear, it is cyclic, like in nature. Um, it is different understanding with death, that death is not, like life doesn't end when you die, and, and there are spirits, and, and, um, uh, and uh, it is very important to understand the smoke sauna, not just that like it's one building, but it's the whole thing. Yeah, I had a question. Have you got any negative feedback or kind of reactions which you could consider like negative feedback? Did mm. people in the back here? Is there? Okay. Mm. Um, I've gotten uh, this kind of, for example, there was a woman who came and said that, mm, um, yeah, but. Uh, um, but there are so ugly women. And there are men who have said, oh, but there are so ugly women there. <laughs> ah, I, but I understand they're ugly because, and then it means that it's not sexualized. So I have to, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do a lot of work of, uh, of explaining, for example, or like, oh, but there is a, you said there is no male gaze, but there is a, a breast scene. And I'm like, you are sexualizing breast. Uh, the idea that you think that the breast scene means a uh, male gaze is that you look at the breast with a male gaze is the question how you portray it. Uh, I, and then they're like, no, it should all be covered like in Arab countries? Yeah, like in Arab countries. I'm like, that's it? That's, do you think this is the way out? No, it's not. So we have had these kind of talks. Uh, then, um, and yeah, basically all this uh, this, what you can call neg negative feedback, has come from these kind of comments like, oh, yeah, oh, they're ugly, or like, um, uh, um, ah, and when I talk about, uh, when I say that the problem is in the patriarchal thinking, and then uh, when you already say patriarchy, then people, some people are like burning, like, what do you mean by that? Patriarchal thinking. And, um, and then I'm saying that patriarchal thinking, uh, we suffer all of that, it goes beyond gender, so I talk about that. So some, um, some very, um, how can I say, there have been uh, negative feedback from people who are, who are very clear concepts, very conservative concepts of what uh, female and male gender should look like. But uh, there have been much more, there are just a few, much more different uh, 
positive feedback and also uh, opening of discussions, a lot of opening of discussions and uh, a lot of feedback from mail actually, from different areas. I did just recently, just last week, uh, there came an interview in Mole, it's more conservative, targeted audience and the journalist was also asking, you know, like, oh, this, yeah, this, yeah, and this kind of questions and then I was explaining uh, but then she, uh, he said that he really actually, oh, this ma film made him think uh, different and he really enjoyed it and can you come to sauna with us and explain more. <laughs> so um, it's, it's opening discussions. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Can you explain more? I think I don't understand. I guess it's like the patriarchal stuff, like yeah. talking also about how a lot of ASLs don't really discuss their feelings, and so how do ASLs respond? To oh, this is amazing. This has opened so many discussions. Uh, this is like something that even the people from church um, who are like, yes, please go to see the film, and we should talk much more. So the discussion, what has happened, um, there have been a lot of feedback is that this is where really, like I can say, 95% um, from them are like, we should, we should, like Estonians are okay in a way, more okay with that physical nudity, but not so okay and not so used with emotional um, nudity. And how, how uh, to start those discussions, I was just telling today, I got this email from Teri Soyolit, or I don't remember the union's name, but there are psychologists and doctors and they asked me to be part of the conference. They had read all my interviews and watched the film and said it's very, very important. So hopefully we can do something. And so it's, it's been talked a lot that we need to open up and, and kind of hold things inside. And that's where a lot of um, feedback from male have, has also been that, uh, that they, are, they are also suffering because the patriarchy tells that they have to be strong, not weak, and um, so they shut down their emotions. So it's this kind of discussions have been there. Mm -hmm. I have this dream, and I hope it's becoming a reality. That, but I have, I have the feeling that the smoke so sister would think it's becoming a bit like a movement, uh, in addition to being a film. I really hope to uh, change something in the society and in the world. We have a t-shirt, let's do a draw. Like lottery. Okay. Uh, oh no, there is. Six rows and uh, I think ten seats in each row, so. No, I, 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 I ask. Ah. Hendrik. Hendrik, let Hendrik do it. Or you can pick a number between. Oh, oh you have a system. Yeah. Oh, you have a system. No, you have, have, yeah. have a system. Oh, yeah, we have a system, so we have a row and four and two. Oh, let's do uh, four and two, so fourth row. Well, I just want to feel that. Yes. Very good. But the size is good. Hang on, photo up, photo up. Photo up. Oi, another text. And uh, uh, we need more points now from South Estonia. Moonshine. Moonshine. It is. <laughs> and uh, just, uh, uh, we can later do a song, as we always do, but two, two lines. Armas väke veemu, armas väke veemu, aid juma, aid juma, aid juma, aid juma, aid juma, aid juma, aid
Федерации по решению должны знать, что ответ России приведет вас к таким последствиям, с которыми вы свои истории еще не имеете. So, um, you're the producer or the director? I'm both. Well, there you go. <laughs> could, could you introduce yourself and the whole project in a few, in a, just to give a few introductory comments um, first? I, uh, I don't, sorry, this is Marianne Goth. <laughs> and please go. Um, what, 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 where to start? <laughs> Where, how, how, how did you start with this project? How about uh, uh, it? Also, took me quite a lot of time to to produce it because I started it. Um, it's, a, it's a long story. Okay, uh, I started some other project in, in the city named Yekaterinburg, uh, where this uh, film takes uh, place. It's uh, the city. It's uh, in the. It's situated in the middle of Russia in Urals. Uh, this is cities which is famous. Uh, it has a very rich history. Um, it's the city where the last Russian Tsar with his family were killed and buried there. Uh, then in uh, in uh, ninety one, uh, when Estonia get freedom, uh, they wanted also to separate from Russia. It was a Ural Republic made, and even uh, they even uh, it's not the part of my film. But I'm just ex explaining <laughs> the uh, yeah explaining uh, the situation. Uh, they even um, printed uh, money already, euro money, and uh, at this time uh, the president of Russia was uh, Yeltsin, and uh, he was ready to sign the uh, the law that they they are you know allowed to be separated, but then somebody stopped him. Uh, then later on, um, uh, the uh, city or citizens uh, elected um, their own uh, mayor of the city, Evgeny Roisman, uh, and uh, now he is actually under the arrest. Uh, and I started uh, as a producer one uh, Moscow director asked me to be a producer for her film about Evgenia Roisman. And then we went there for, for, the, sh for the development and um, I realized that uh, in his life will never, nothing happened significant for or enough for a feature long documentary. Uh, but I liked so much this place, this city. I had already contacts there. And I started to think that this city can be a model for for the contemporary Russia, of Putin's Russia mostly. There are a lot of political movements there in, in one city. Uh, and I started to film in 2017. Um, I had a fantastic uh, uh, Polish uh, cinematographer, Kasper Chubak. And we filmed it in 4K and uh, uh, cinemascope format, so it's meant to be shown on the big screen. And actually, the quality of uh, screen is here absolutely fantastic. I think you experienced also, right? Uh, so, yeah, it took uh, quite a lot of time. Then we I have also a Danish uh, editor, Jesper Rosmond with whom we, ha we were planning to start uh, editing on, in March 2020. We all remember what yeah. happened. <laughs> <laughs> so we stopped and he, he was planning to come to Tallinn for editing. Uh, and then it took a long time to try to edit in online, which didn't work at all. We didn't much move on. Uh, so in 2014, one, I think, I, was it 21? Yeah, 21. Um, I went to pitch the project to Malmo in, 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 in Sweden and, and then we decided to meet there. So we start to physically be together 
uh, from that period, and then we start really to to move on with, with editing. Uh, then the we mostly we mostly edited the film when when uh, this 24th of February 2022 happened, and um, my husband asked me what you will do with your film now because there are so many projects who really failed because of that they didn't work anymore, but I was quite. Uh, sure that everything, I do have everything in my film because by this time we already edited the, the opening episode and the final episode and they both were about the war. So uh, I think um, what's happening with this film is that thanks to, to the war, people who didn't much knew about what's happening in Putin's Russia now to understand quite more things or can read these metaphors which I, which I do have in the film. We, all, we just are starting our, our life with the film. It's uh, nothing to say right now because we had a world premiere here in, in, in Toronto at Hot Dogs. Um, the feedback was very good. I mean, I like, I think the Hot Dogs audience is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think they developed with a with a um, grown up with a with a festival because now this this year festival is celebrating 30 years. So it looks like if you look on on, on the audience, it's mostly I think those who started 30 years ago to go to watch uh, documentary films and and. Uh, um, I can say that I don't. I don't have like a, a list of questions because it's. I so have only, I yeah. have only two screenings, but I can. I can. I even can. Can't say that they. They were all very original uh, uh, and very profound. So they were not questions even about the f how I film this or that, although there were questions how 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 I get the access because I have filmed in the courts and I have filmed in. in churches and in, in, in different places uh, but the, the questions are always very very profound like beyond the film you know so the film uh, gives um, or gave some ideas or some understandings about what's happening in Russia right now but then people want to know more and ask ask some, some more more complicated questions which which are quite even you know, you need a lot of time to, to answer them, or probably to some questions, even can't give answers for. I think they can, but they can't. So, uh, yeah, so it's... And w what I have to say also is that with, with Anna's film, is it's very... How do you say? It's, it has such a positive power. Uh, you, you really want to, to change something in, in your life, or if you have problems, or and you see this kind of promising energy <laughs> and, and, and I like those kind of films. I, I always also did my own films before, so I, 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 I think films should be uh, giving some positive path, uh, whatever, even if they were very, very hard topics. But unfortunately with this film, with the last relic, is that I can't, Give any <laughs> and and we tried actually in, in the in the editing room, but it, it's not possible because I don't see I don't see how this awful thing was happening on Ukraine and in Russia as, uh, as well uh, can be solved. Mm. I, I don't see this. So this this story is uh, this story is uh, trash. I don't know if uh, anybody saw a film. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like... I had some questions, right? Which yeah, you yeah, yeah. Ask me, so so I, I feel like when I watched it, I was watching like a lost world or like in a snow globe, you know, that you wouldn't be able to make this film today. So it gives it another layer of of just looking into something that, in a way,
doesn't, we don't have access to it anymore. And it's also just summing up so ge in like this genius way without any words actually from you. It's just like chapters basically. But it just sums up um, how it got to that, how, how we got to that point. Uh, yeah, I don't want to give away too much, but it's, uh, it was yeah very powerful to especially see it on big screen and uh, very very well done. Just a comment. No, 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 no big question. But yeah, like maybe what you find is like the like how like do you think? you will be able to make these kind of films going there, going forward? No, no, I, I used to uh, to go to, especially to Saint Petersburg, to, you know, to visit concerts and, uh, and like operas, <laughs> so I went to there. I can't go anymore. I, I, it's psychological, I can't. It's uh, unless, unless there will be really changes in, in, in the country. It's, Unfortunately, I didn't see it this afternoon, but my husband did, and he can't be here right now, but he was very, uh, he talked a lot about, this after when he got home, about the fact that he did get access to court sessions, and he couldn't, he just, it, it's something we all hear about, but to actually see it on the big screen, he, he was, said he saw that people, uh, actually, this uh, this question about the court, how we get again, it was that was the one <laughs> who always asked uh, was asked. Uh, it wasn't a problem actually. It, it was uh, uh, it was a surprise for us as well. But um, he, uh, as I do understand, the law or was a law. Of course, now it wasn't. It won't be possible at all, you know. But uh, this. Uh, when we were filming, uh, if the court is not officially, uh, how it's called, clo closed, uh, in camera or yeah, yeah. close to the public, yeah, go close to the public, uh, then it's all depend on the on the judge, uh, the a defender who defends uh, exactly this de defendant <laughs> person has to make a. Um, appeal or something like that where they we gave our passports and uh, our names and everything and and then uh, the charge is deciding we we just each time we went there we didn't know if we will get this permission at the very last moment and then said oh, yes we can't go and then we were rushing you know with cameras and everything but it's it wasn't like this it's it's uh, it's by law, it's okay, you know, so we get it. I know people are shocked because it's, you've never been there, right, as a, as a viewer, and, it's, uh, and we were very close. It was one, one, one funny moment when my camera man was, he was so in, in the situation, when the judge, they were watching um, um, some video, uh, videos, uh, as a proof of that evidence, evidence, yes, uh, on the on the monitor on his desk, you know, and my camera came so close, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was like it was okay. I mean, but uh, also I think this is a, it was a sign of the of the time because everyone was filming, policemen were filming. Uh -huh. Now they are only filming. They don't need you know make protocols. They just filming. And they put in, in uh, I don't know, their archives, and then later on, it's uh, it was um, uh, it is planned to policy in, in Russia that you you're not arresting immediately somebody, you know, you but you film your all time record what's happening during the meetings and during the rallies, and then if needed, you take out this cassettes or files and you find those people there and then you go and arrest them so this is so they are uh, they were filming all the time and we see it all in the film and the same things uh, activists themselves were filming also they were filming what police is doing you know yeah. then we were also without a camera 
their filming. And um, one also funny moment was that I realized it from the very beginning and then start to use it because, again, it's something with some, uh, uh, some law, I don't know, uh, some instructions that policemen, policemen uh, get, but uh, we were always asked, when we were filming on the street, we were all, always asked, uh, somebody from police came <coughs> and asked uh, who you are, what you are filming, and the main thing you should say was, we are not a press. They were always afraid of press, and if you, if you are press, then they start to check your documents, you have to have a permission to film, and this kind of thing. And if you say, <coughs> we are not the press, we are filming a film, they suddenly <laughs> lose their interest. <laughs> so, it, was, it, was, it was strange, you know, but, but it worked. And then each time when I understood that it is working, every time any policeman came, I, I was already heard, we are filming, <laughs> we are not the press, we are filming the film. We are artists. We are artists, <laughs> yes. Did you ever feel in danger or um, threatened in any way? Uh, or it was kind of before it... Um, I can't say that I, I, I felt danger. I, I can say that only that we have an agreement with my cameraman. I always say that whatever happened, if any will come to us and will ask whatever, you are filming, you, you don't see anything. You film, you do what, what I said, you, you do that. And I will deal with, with the problems because we have also a fixer, a local local guy fixer, and we have a camera assistant was also local, and sound recorder was also local. Uh, we speak with each other in Russian, but with cameraman in English. And uh, I can say that probably uh, each time we came, we were like having. Like, seven or something sessions. We went there for two couple of weeks or something like that, seven times. And uh, each time I came, it was obvious the situation is getting worse and worse. In terms of people were getting more afraid and not to that we were filming them or that they were afraid of us, but they always wanted to have a, a permission from upper Yeah. Hi, hi, yeah, some, and this is a very big um, area, this Sverdlovsk Oblast. It's, uh, uh, they have their own ministries, uh, Minister of Culture, Minister of Education, and for example, these quarters we filmed, uh, I, I, yes, um, we were filming a ball, and then I heard that somebody is very beautifully singing, you know, and then I went to, to watch, and I saw these quarters, this gorgeous quarters. And go, oh, I, I need them in, the, in my film. And then I talked with the, uh, with the conductor or for, with the manager, I can't remember. And then I think, yes, 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 film. Of course, and they were so happy that we want them to film. And then they went, like, we have also uh, balalaikas, <laughs> some <laughs> additional orchestra of balalaikas. And can you film them also? So, of course. <laughs> Even I didn't know one of them, but like, of course I will film them. And then, uh, and then we agreed already on the time when we next time will come for the f shootings, and then we will already uh, departing. And somebody suddenly, administrator was running, stop, stop, no, no, you can't film us because we need you need a permission from Minister of Culture. You know? So, so we, and that means that we uh, we just uh, I, I write a letter, official letter from my company, and we all we just needed to wait a little bit, uh, but we already always get the permissions, and the, probably the the most complicated was to get the permission to film. Uh, the Victory Day, so-called Victory Day rehearsal, and that I, and that I needed for hundred percent. I needed this episode. I knew that very well, 
and uh, my fixer, he he was absolutely gorgeous um, in negotiations. <laughs> I, I I really relied on him. So I said to him, whatever you do, but I need this. So he spent like two days in uh, city council uh, negotiating with people and always like calling me, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Uh, but this. Um, uh, rehearsal, uh, parade rehearsal, it took three evenings. They were doing it three evenings. So first evening we didn't get the permission. And then uh, and then the second, uh, at the end sh he get, but he get, you know, like always in Russia, you get, a, they, they gave him a certificate that we can film, but, uh, uh, but in reality, they didn't have this, this right, you know, to, to give this because it's sort of like <laughs> it's sort of like uh, uh, this parade is under the military forces, you know. So this, uh, sit, uh, but uh, but the parade itself is just um, be, um, on the main square where this uh, uh, council city building is. So they sort of gave us a certificate, which was not real you know. <laughs> so with that we went and we showed somewhere and then we we find this one uh, spot where I needed to this camera to stay and just to not to move anywhere and then we met there uh, a guy who I actually didn't remember him but I, he remembered us uh -huh. and uh, we were filming in, in one cadet school and before that like in the previous se session, not this time even, and he he came to us and said, "Now I have a problems because because of you that you filmed there," uh, and uh, and uh, and and then he stand just camera, and the, those troops had to come like that, and he stand exactly here, you know, with this big belly, you know, so. <laughs> and then, and, and, and couldn't get away, you know, so I, I asked him, and he was just standing there, now I will stand here, and then I came to him to, okay, thank you very much, we will film you, thank you very much, and then he ran away, but then he go, went to, to one military Boss, I don't know, whatever, uh, complaining, you know, I don't know what he said about uh, us. Again, my cameraman was filming, not, not mentioning it. And then, uh, uh, but there was one guy from the city council with us, and we still don't know what kind of power he had, and why those military men listened to him. So this, this man was barely was complaining three times. He went more and like more up, 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 but we, nobody, so it worked out for us. But it was like really, not that we would be arrested or whatever, we still were, we, we were foreigners and the maximum they can do is just to uh, cancel our visas and we should be deported. That was very bad for, for the film, <laughs> that I didn't want. <laughs> Uh, but not like we were at the danger or whatever. Of being arrested or anything. Yeah, no. Any questions? Peter. Yeah, I have a question about the title. We are all seeing the film, mm. but uh, the last relic for Estonians who use the bell is mm. so popular. Mm. Estonian feature mm. film. It's in Estonia. It's uh, my 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 film. My film title is Vi Mane Relik. We meet Vi Mane Relik. Uh, I, uh, this thing is that when I started to work on, on, on this idea, it was first, uh, it was 2017 and in 2018, there was a uh, hundred years since uh, this uh, last Tsar was killed. And uh, it was a big um, issue with the uh, remains of uh, Tsar family. Because the Russian uh, Russian uh, church is not uh, uh, Tunista. It doesn't accept. It doesn't, doesn't accept, uh, doesn't accept uh, those, that those remains belong to Tsar family. 
they still, they still, have it. it's very complicated story. <laughs> it would take a lot of time to explain, but it's like that, you know. So, and uh, it's uh, at this uh, at this um, period, um, it's looked that um, they will uh, accept them. There was a new criminal uh, case opened just to go again through all this team car and uh, everything, checking the. And first, I was uh, planning to make this film around that, you know. But then, uh, as it happens in, in documentary, you, you you wait for financing, and you know, time goes on, and then then it's too late, you know, to, <laughs> to do something on that. And then my also my uh, idea had has start to grow up and I wanted, I, 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 thought, I thought it's too narrow, you know, I need more and especially with this, uh, with this topic or this subject you need more time, uh, or not more time, you need uh, different, you, you have to go to the history and I didn't want to make a historical film, I wanted to make a f film about uh, actual things happening there and that's why I sort of, in film I have some sort of, you, you saw, sort of Something about that, but not. I'm going. I'm not going deeply in this uh, remains thing, you know. And then, uh, so this came, the title came then, you know. And then uh, each time uh, I have a, like a new level of uh, of my production. I always check: does it still work? The, the title, does it still work? <laughs> it still worked. You know? Then I go on, and at the end, when we. Finished the film. I was still considering to to change the title, but to be honest, I didn't I didn't find it. Any. And then and, and then this one still was working with uh, with a new meaning, you know. So I today when I had a, a screening today, I, there was also a question about that. One question, and I asked, "What do you think yourself? What, what, how you define this uh, title?" And, this man, he said, I, I think very well. It's, yes, it's 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 Putin. It's, <laughs> it's Putin with the last relic for them. Next screening. It's on. Uh, 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 we have the Estonian premiere on tenth of May. So I'm now waiting for that. I mean, preparing for that. So but there's one more screening. In no, the no, here not. But but uh, you are in the competition, so maybe. There will be one more screen. Oh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> yes. That's, that's I don't know. I just wanted to comment that I uh, today was I was planning to see today, and then I went to another film because I decided I would see yours in Estonia. Uh, I saw the trailer for the first time and I really regret. The other thing was good, cool, but I really regret. I can't wait. On 10th of May. Yo, yes. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is it is it online? Is it streaming? It is here in the festival. Yes, in the festival. Yeah, yeah, but I should like. Uh, from the yeah, but yeah. the only thing is, uh, as, as I said, this film. There are films which can be watched on the smaller screen. But I, 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 I CBC who make a made a. Uh, interview with me, they came to Tallinn before I came here because they are now uh, this Moscow uh, um, headquarters, or how it's called, the Moscow, Moscow. Oh, the uh, news bureau. Yeah, 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 news bureau. They they moved now because they were expelled from yeah. Russia, so they moved to Riga. So thanks to that, they, they came to Tallinn also, and. Um, uh, the journalist, uh, she, saw, she saw two times before that the film uh, on, on her computer, and then he came, she came to Thailand to. I made the press uh, press uh, screening for for the press and for uh, for the Russian oppositionist opposition journalists who are now living in Thailand. So we put them together, and and she she decided. First she said, "Oh, I saw already two times. I will not." And then she did, "No, I, I will still, I will watch it on the." And then she said that it's totally, it's very important to see it on the on the big screen. So she had a, this comparison. So Inga, you all have to go to ASD for May 10th. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or you can bring it back. I'm sure you will find uh, the Canadian distributor also. So 
so you can go to Canadian yeah. cinemas. Right. My district, my sales agent is there. Oh. Rising <laughs> shark. Rising shark. Stefan. Sure, he'll come here. Edith. I have only one tricky question. Why do you not use the Estonian Premier on 9th of May? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. No, we were considering that even. Uh, we were considering that, but we then they decided it's not so important, to be honest. It's Actually, we, we uh, it just happened that we can't, uh, we can't, we, we can't uh, wait until autumn, right? <laughs> because of this, what's happening with Russia, and we don't know what, what will be in the autumn. So it was important also for the film uh, release in cinemas in, ta in, in Estonia, it's very bad time. May it's uh, it's late, you know. It's uh, the sun is shining, you know. <laughs> Everybody wants to be outside, and nobody wants to go to the dark cinema, you know. But I have it's a sure. I, but I was yeah, but I was because of this world premiere here. We couldn't show it before, you know. So so uh, we had to wait until hot dogs, and then after hot dogs immediately to release it in Estonia. Ninth, no, we decided it's not 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 simple. What, what, should, it how, how, he, how it, what, what does it give? It's a statement, no? It would have no. been a statement, no? I have a very stupid question, but why not total uh, Russia? Russia will be there, I think that the war will be over. I don't know what will off. be there, I don't know. <laughs> probably we will not be at all. We, not Russia, Estonia, probably. I don't know. No. We don't know what will happen. Well, congratulations on being in Hot Dogs and the world premiere here in this fabulous city. Thank you very much. And I hope, <laughs> and I hope it rains on May 10th. Yeah, the weather. Yeah.
Siis nimik ja Edina Küllog. 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 Please, and Edina, can you tell us a little bit about the about the film? Seen the trailer? Has anyone seen the film? Yes. Yeah. One, two, three. Four. <laughs> Thanks, Edda. <enough. laughs> and by the way, I should. Well, I'll introduce you at the very end. Can you tell us a little bit about your? Please, you're the director, and you're the, Edina's the producer. Uh, Edina, maybe you could start off and tell us a little bit about how the film came to you and what uh, what made you take on this project. Okay, <laughs> that's a long story, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start from the beginning that uh, we got to know, I got to know Liz through a friend and uh, I was just finishing my, one of my films and I didn't like my producer so much and, and I was complaining to her and then <laughs> somehow she thought that, oh, but why don't you try yourself producing something? She's like, okay, but what? And then I remember exactly that she was pitching me her ideas that she would like to do some film in Laslama in uh, with, with Russians. And then I asked like if she was if she knew Russian enough to make such a film. And then she said like maybe not. <laughs> and then I remember that we were in this Viru hotel, and she was already going home and I was still staying and I was shouting through the zebra but why don't you make a film about heating and she's like why about heating and then maybe I review <laughs> <laughs> I remember that in that time um, it was really popular this uh, Valdor Mikita mm -hmm. everybody was reading he was like a new myth creator and then we then uh, Edin and I we became really really good friends out of nowhere and really quickly and then I went to visit you in the countryside because you lived in the countryside and Edin lived in a in a three story house which had one like a boiler room downstairs and every inhabitant of the house had to do 24 hour shifts <laughs> putting the wood every hour it's not every like hour yeah. every hour uh, filling the furnaces there were two furnaces filling the furnaces with wood and she uh, uh, happened to have that shift in that time and it was really absurd and really funny because the, she had to wake up in the middle of the night with the with the alarm clock. Like, right? Yeah, I was putting my alarm, and, and for I'm a Hungarian person. I, I I I was raised in Budapest, in a big city. We know nothing about heating, nothing about uh, cutting the woods, nothing. So when I came to Estonia and when I moved to the countryside, this was for me. It, it's just an amazing new world. And, and I wanted to introduce it to my Estonian friend, like, come on, look, look how, how all Estonia lives, you know, in the countryside. And for me, it was an absurd. Uh, I was always a zombie after heating for one day, two days I was sleeping. So anyways, yes, so <laughs> that was this uh, uh, heating came kind of like into focus. And then we had, we have this, um, the best, uh, scriptwriter in Estonia, Antti Naulainen, who is a non-writing scriptwriter. <laughs> His method is that he talks to the filmmakers to discover like what they really want to do and what is really inside of them. And so we had long discussions about heating and uh, yes, so in the beginning it all revolved around that and um, and it made us realize like how it keeps us awake and we need to take care of the warmth uh, in order to have it. And then uh, later I started doubting this heating thing. It, it, ah. it, it wasn't like, I, I, we were already filming, but I felt that like it cannot be the, the focus of the film uh, because it it's too simple and, and the film needs more depth and um, and then the big philosophical 
search started and then where do you go to find answers? You have to go inside yourself and, and to your childhood and, and I started digging this meaning for that film and, and of course I found it from my childhood. I found it from from the way Anna is saying always this word about the sound as sacred place. Uh, I think the whole Estonian nature is a sacred place. And the way we relate to nature in Estonia is really special. I think all Estonians share this special feeling that we want to be in the in the summer in the Heinama and, uh, and smell the smell and everything. And, and it's like a magnetic thing for us. And I wanted to... My grandmother passed away and with her um, this way of being inside nature, living in, in nature without really needing anything. She was like the poorest, but she lived like the richest. And, and, and I wanted to capture that spirit um, that, that we all share. I think there is, in Estonian literature, there is a lot written about it. Like how rich is Estonian literature of of uh, uh, explaining or describing Estonian uh, nature. But in film, I would say that that it always ends up in like verbal dis description. But I wanted to allow the language of film to share that uh, feeling, that order to capture that feeling that we all share, but we don't know what it exactly is, we cannot really verbalize it. Uh, I write, I find, still I find like um, it's difficult for me to talk about the film because it has been such a deep experience of explaining something without words mm -hmm. and now I have to find words like you, you make a symphony and then you have to describe the symphony in two, two sentences and it's so difficult for me. So then what was the role of music in the film? The role of music? Ah, there there's is no music. There is, officially there's no music in oh. the film. <laughs> but, um, so, we went to the nature, we found these people. I, in order to explain, I have to say also that we were looking for people uh, with a kind of a um, certain sense of indifference in the best sense of the word. In Estonian language we say uh, indifference is uskeksus. Uh, uskeksus, uh, if you turn it around, it means all is one. Uh, so it has, like, our language is very wise. It has a deep meaning that we have. Because probably forgotten, but uh, then we are not really understanding it in the same way anymore. The word has this like, kind of a negative connotation to it. But, but for us it was a really important word. And um, we were looking for people with this indifference towards the conditions of, of um, consumption and all of these things. So uh, and whenever we drove to somebody's yard. Well, basically, we started um, doing these expeditions to Estonia to find the people. And, and whenever we drove to somebody's uh, garden or yard, and, and we felt that peace uh, that was similar to, to my grandmother's way of life, then this person became the character of the film. And so, that was the basis of choosing the characters. But what happened during the filmmaking was that uh, almost all of them started to practice uh, an instrument or like really from zero, uh, grown-ups as well. And then uh, um, making art, gardening. Uh, so this metaphor of keeping the fire up, it actually kind of became more profound and deeper uh, in the sense that we also have to take care of our inner fire. 
and our inner fire is very much related to inspiration. And the inspiration now, after making this film, I, I know <laughs> that is very much related to, to nature. And to time. And to time. So, I uh, uh, was just thinking before when you asked like, what are the questions that are asked from Anna. We have only had three screenings so far, but the first question that was asked from us was, how did you stop time? <laughs> and I think it was a really beautiful question because we were filming on 16 millimeter and uh, that is also already something that makes the filming process very like holy in a way because one for the very pragmatic reason it, it's so expensive you know when the film is rolling it, it, it's really expensive but uh, the other reason is also that that it, some sort of magic happens on film and and especially in the beginning of our filming process um, the Every time we rolled the camera, the, the room became completely different. Everybody had their antennas in the maximum sensitivity. Everyone in the room. And, and uh, it really felt like time stopped. So it was really a beautiful thing that the first question that was asked, like, how did you stop time? Will there be another screening at one Yes, Still tomorrow at five is, yes. is a screening. So tomorrow at five. Yeah, right. and to make an advertisement, I can say that mm, yesterday, no, yes, yesterday in the screening, there was an actor from LA, and he said that after watching the film, he said that this was like a documentary version of uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that, that it seemed like the land where the hobbits live and uh, <laughs> what else did he say? The hobbits live and, and then fight against the big bad. Yeah, fight against the big evil. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, it was a really <laughs> interesting comparison. <laughs> Maybe we should use it in the yeah. marketing. <laughs> 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 yes. What else can we share? Well, there is a lot. There is a lot, yeah. Has it screened in AST already? No, uh, we will do the premiere in, um, in the end of September. So, we'll, no, we just started with uh, the world premiere was in Switzerland last week in Mission oh. Durel, uh, which is a very nice festival. And, and yes, tomorrow will be the fourth screening of the film. Maybe I would like to say why I like this film so much because I mean it's very difficult to see nowadays a film which uh, you watch it and then you just get together with yourself and I think this film has this effect on people if you let yourself go into it dive into it and you will discover yourself, and I, I think it's a very rare thing. Also, that was my goal a little bit, that I wanted to make a film where if the viewer is brave enough to be within their own thoughts, then it would be a very enjoyable experience. <laughs> but if not, then maybe you don't, maybe it's going to be hard, but but it doesn't have a narrative, like it, it's a gallery of people living within nature, being in contact uh, with something and I didn't, I wanted to take away all the possible kind of romanticization of anything, like heating or Estonia or, or anything that you can put a finger on because I wanted it to kind of transcend to a story about time and, and chance and nature and, um, and sun, which was a, also a funny story that um, the film was ready, it was a long process, eight years, well, it was a long process for many reasons, uh, there was this uh, thing that 
uh, in the beginning, work. we had this filming method that um, we put the camera and then we were waiting for life to fill the frame. So it was, first we chose the frame very carefully and then we were waiting for life to fill the frame without uh, directing anything and, and we were always hoping for shots that will have like the beginning, middle and end, you know, like a, a shot with a story. And there came a lot in the beginning uh, because everything was new to us, to the characters and it was this magic of 60 millimeter. everything was happening. But more the time went on, the magic kind of like, I was kind of like a hunter for these shots, you know, yeah. these good shots. And the more time went on, the less they started to appear. And that put me in a long crisis because I, we had only like some reels left and uh, a big plan on the paper that I knew that we are not able to fulfill because we don't have enough reels. And then um, what saved us was that COVID came. And then I gave birth to a baby and there was this gap of everything stopping and I had uh, to these two things, the two major things that happened uh, kind of uh, created some free space in my brain and at some point when I was nursing the baby I suddenly I had this epiphany, oh my god I have a film already I don't need to film anything anymore. So then it was kind of boiling, boiling inside. I couldn't really work on it because I was with the kid. And then finally I had like time. I was like, I drove to the office and I, I edited the film in three days. Like a, it was like a, you know, like a creative channel. Everything was open, like finished. And then it took another, well, I don't know, one and a half years to do the sound. <laughs> because I was, yeah, I couldn't. I was raising my kid and then um, uh, the last thing that was missing was the title. I was, I read, I think, I was looking so hard for the title. I read all the poem, poem books that are uh, released in Estonia, <laughs> looking for the title, and, and I, I think I had like ten titles of the, for the film. You know? Yeah, we were like a bit. They were laughing at me. Like, okay. Okay, the new title. Okay. Yeah, again. But but when she came up with this one, because we called the film for a long time Firekeepers, but mm -hmm. yeah, and when she came up with this one, then I think. Uh, Everybody was nobody laughing. Had, nobody was yeah. laughing anymore, but yeah. in the meantime, everybody was laughing at me, and I was really frustrated. And then it was really, again, a process that went into a total crisis. And then uh, I was walking with my child, and I was looking at her, and I was thinking, what will she remember, you know, like all of these long walks that we take, and she won't remember anything of that. And then I started, like, thinking about my... Like digging out my own childhood memories, the first ones that I had. And then I remember, suddenly I remember this uh, moment that I wrote Paikes um, Kell on the paper. I copied it from a book. And then my mother came and I showed her and she was, wow, you can write, you know, this, this, I don't know, a random moment. And I remembered that word and then when I, when I remembered that word, then suddenly I had like a click. And I didn't want to call the film Paikisikel because Kel is not such a nice word, but then I put Paikisak. And then I realized that the whole film is related to that. Uh, the rhythm of life, direct, uh, um, not directed, but um, measured, by. measured by, by sun or like dictated by some, let's say, the, the rhythm of life, the inner uh, sun that appears as inspiration. <coughs> then I noticed that I have this color of red throughout the film that is like really like methodically appearing. 
and then how the sun in the film is hidden until the very end when it's still hidden behind the fog. Uh, uh, and it's like, I, I understood that the whole film is totally composed after that title, but I was not aware of that myself, so <laughs> it was a very, very subconscious process. I have a yeah, I, I just, I what camera like, what were you using? And is there a film laboratory in yeah. Estonia? Uh, we used the uh, Arton film camera and uh, no, there is a lot, no lab, that, uh, we did it in UK. Uh, yeah. UK. We had to mm. research like because of the prices, so I was researching like uh, Czech Republic, Hungary. I even got these rolls from Belatar uh, because we had no money to buy enough and then... Yeah. We were testing the rolls from Belatar but they were too old. We could yeah. use them. It oh. would have been legendary. <laughs> there <laughs> is the leftovers shot. from Benata. Yeah, but there is one shot in the film from that role. Yes, one shot, yes. The best. Maria? I didn't see the film yet, but my question was you say that we don't have music there, so we need you have sound. We work a lot of sound. We have the same sound designers, so. Uh, my husband, uh, my film, and your film. So, very interesting to hear how you work with him. Uh, yes, uh, actually, yes, I didn't answer your question about the music. Uh, that um, the music I had when I went to Israel, I said there will be no music. I don't want music. There is no. no you have to explain who is Israel. Huh? You have to explain who is Israel. Ah, Israel is uh, Mexican sound designer living in Estonia and he was actually my student in the university. You see? <laughs> On cue. <Yeah>. On cue. <laughs> he was my student in the university but uh, somehow we started talking and, and I felt that he's the right guy for my film. And yes, so he took that uh, thing very seriously. No music. But the characters were all making music, so my idea was that the, that the film, the music in the film, is this uh, non-professional, non-perfect uh, instrument. How um, do uh, practicing. practicing? That this is the only music. But then Israel was very, how can I say, very, very clever. He. Um, uh, started to propose this kind smart. of smart. smart, yeah, tones. He was proposing tones, and uh, well, I have to say that for me also the sound design was a very big process because it took me time to understand that I cannot manipulate with sound with that film because it will kill it. It will kill the fragility because we have these long, slow shots and they cannot be full of sound. They have to be very, like, minimal. So I had it very clear in my mind that uh, the first half of the film is basically only set, set sound. And then in the second part of the film where the inspiration kind of like becomes bigger, then we, we uh, do some magic with the sound. But then, yeah, Israel had this, I don't know, like a uh, machine that is, is, it has, it has human voices recorded inside and then you play on it and it, it makes like human voice music, uh, I don't, I have never seen it, I don't remember what was the name of that machine. But anyways, he made some, some, some tones on it and then I think now the film sounds like a, uh, Symphony, uh, it is still full of music, but then until now he refuses to say that it's music. So I think he, he just wants to keep to his original promise, but he should be credited as a, as a composer for that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come to see the film tomorrow at five. In the
books. Uh, at TIFF. Mm -hmm. at TIFF. Mm -hmm. yes. This has been a most unusual evening. I was thinking back to the SDOCS days, and at no time would we have had a Q&A without everyone having watched the film. Yeah. <laughs> this really is a very odd experience, but I think it will encourage us to, well, to see the one screening that we have left, and hopefully one more. Mariana, if, uh, yeah. And we have also. We have you have one more. Oh, that's right, I have to get to that. Yes. Actually, our film <laughs> is also in a competition in the meat leg section. Uh, okay. It's not like a separate program in the, in the program, but there is, apparently there is a competition. There's uh, also a, a, an audience award, right? Uh, and all films are automatically. Yeah. No, we are not in uh, competition of an audience. I think it is also a Ukrainian film. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, if you go on Friday, please vote. Uh, yes, yes, yes. There is an internet, top 20. Uh, and you can get to the top 20. It's not very uh, important, but it's nice. And we didn't even pop up there because I think everyone wanted to talk to Anna and who remember the vote. So we can write it. It would be nice to be in this list for a moment. Edda, I wanted to know if you had, uh, from generally from the Estonian film industry, Eesti Film Institute, if you have had uh, anything to add to our wonderful presentations this evening. <coughs> and this microphone is just full of germs, so <laughs> really sorry. Hi, it's so nice to be here, and uh, I'm extremely happy that we have uh, such good films. And uh, it's it's not very I, I would say it's unusual to have uh, three films in such a festival and uh, and it's it has been like an extremely good year for Estonian films especially documentaries and uh, there are some things which are very common to these films these are all made by women film filmmakers. So it's a lot of girl power in Estonian <laughs> film. And all these films have... Uh, in Estonian there is a very nice word in Kaua tehtud kaunikke. And, and uh, I think uh, this, uh, this sentence uh, is valid for all these films. So thank you for coming. Thank you Estonian filmmakers for such a good films. And I hope that uh, all these films have an uh, amazing future. And thank you. <laughs> what is your title with, with EST Film Institute? Uh, head of Marketing. Head of Marketing. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. I believe now we have some moonshine on offer. And uh, yes. we can all take a little uh, sample of Southern Estonia home. And in uh, love with Film. I thank you. And you don't buy them, you just have to know the people. And then you get them. We call it Sorma Dubi. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is a, a song, uh, I say it's an old song, Ready Laul, I say the first line and everyone can sing after. And it's about the importance of singing. It's like metaphor that our heart would sing till because in, in death we can we can then we can be quiet. But till we are alive, let's celebrate life and let's have like song in our hearts. Laula laula sukene, laula laula sukene, liku linnu kele kene, liku linnu kele kene, ilutse südame kene, ilutse südame kene. Sa siis saad vaiki olla, küll sa siis saad vaiki olla, kui saad alla musta mulla, kui saad alla musta mulla, kena kirstu keskelle. Okay. 
kevät Kanada eestä se keeseen, väkevät Kanada eestä se keeseen. Väke veesti koodu kond üle ilma, väke veesti kookond üle ilma. Olgem hoitud, olgem kaitstud, olgem hoitud, olgem kaitstud. Me süda mõistaks laulda, et me süda mõistaks laulda, et me hingi ka heliseks, et me hingi ka heliseks. Palju jõuda kõigile meil, palju jõudu kõigile meil, hoida vägevad enda juured, hoida Lasta Eesti keele laulda, lasta Eesti keele laulda, oma lugu jutustada, oma lugu jutustada. Selle on teinud vahtik. Seda ma arvan. Kui sul ei olnud? Yes, sir.